Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors. We're now going to be doing episode 168, and we're going to be talking about how many are there in the therapy process. Oh, what a wonderful title. <clears throat> when I thought this up, it has its um, its background, if you like, to me being a transaction analyst. Um, because in the transaction analysis model, you split the, you know, we're talking about a personality model of the psyche yeah, um, into three. So people listening will know this parent part of yourself, adult yeah. part of yourself, and the child part of yourself. So there's... Three parts of the self. Yes. In the sort of model or psychological model that Eric Byrne created, which became the template for transaction analysis in 1960. And of course, Freud himself talked about three parts of the unconscious self way back in probably 1888. So, um, okay, there's a difference between Byrne's view of three parts of self and Freud, but that's not this podcast, really. So in transaction analysis training, <clears throat> I was used to thinking about um, ego state analysis. So when somebody walked in the door for treatment, um, I'd be thinking about which part of the self was I treating. Yeah. And I'd be thinking about how much energy did they come from when they were coming from the parent part, adult part, and child part. So if they're coming from the parent part, lots of energy, they'd be coming from the part of themselves, which, you know, um, they put playing out their parent, authority figures, teachers, people they've internalized at a parent level, if you like. Yeah. They're coming from the younger part of the self. It would be, well, what part of the self are they actually coming from? And if, you know, in terms of age. Yes. Yeah. Elementally. Or... If we're talking about adult parts, so that's when they very much staying in the here and now and haven't got access to go to other parts of the self. So as a TA therapist, you would be analysing and thinking that way anyway. So I'd be trained to think in terms of three. Yes. So that's probably the trigger for this title. Because if you were to ask me that now and said, Bob, are you saying that there's only three, there's just three people in the therapy room psychologically i would say no and then if you said back to me, well how many are there i would say well how long does it to yeah how many are there goodness gracious me there could be hundreds of hundreds and hundreds yeah so, um what's that phrase how how does it i don't know but anyway could how be long's a piece of string basically how, long pieces... how many people there are yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because you've got the internalized parent, you've got the internalized grandfather, you could be the internalized great grandfather, and we could go back for a very long time. Yeah. And then we've got the internalized child of the parent, and we've got the internalized parent of the parent. And we get go right back into past past linear therapy if we wanted to and go all the way back. I remember one marathon that I was doing a very long time ago, it is. And we were doing a talking to the parent, and then out popped the grandparent. That's the father of the parent. So we talked to the father of the parent. And then I out, out popped the father of the father of the father of the father. Wow. Going back there. I'm running out of cushions a bit. And <laughs> we, we jumped a few generations to about the 17th century in a pirate ship. And, a, 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 and um, I don't know how many fathers of the fathers of the fathers this. But we went all the way back in terms of past past life therapy. Um, so there's, there's a, we, we carry in our heads the threads of yeah. many internalized in in psychoanalysis called objects. In TA, would caused internalized others, if you like, often uh, are stored in the parented part of the personality. So. Who 
you know, when somebody walks through the door and we start talking about X, who are we really talking to? Are we talking about the mother, the father, the teacher, the significant other people? Are we talking about God? Are we talking about religion? Are we talking what's been internalized yeah. in that part of itself that is causing the problems so we can't perhaps have resources to other parts of the self? So there's many, many, because we we haven't even started to go to the younger child part of ourselves, have we? Where we can start look at many parts of the self. So if we called, I don't know, a younger part of ourself and an intrapsychic chunk of time, in other words, going backwards, so I'm 73, so if I went for therapy and I started to talk about past events, just think how many parts of the younger self I could go to. Yeah. 73 years. Yeah. And if you think of weeks and months and <laughs> moments Eight in time, well, yeah. Yeah, that's why it's an intrapsychic chunk of psychological time. Yeah. So we can go back a long. So there's many, 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 many people in the therapy room, in my view. Yeah. I agree. I, yeah. You see it that way as well. Absolutely. And, it, you know, it, it's it's been proven to a certain extent with science that a lot of, you know, well, not a lot, but certain things are generational. You know, mm. not just our DNA, but events that maybe one of our ancestors have gone through. It's, it's, it's changed us in the here and now. You know, I'm particularly thinking of people that were in, you know, prison camps at Auschwitz or, places like that you know generationally some of the ancestors have eating disorders that they've they've put it back to that mm. well we can go back further and usually can go back further i don't think therapists often go back more than generations but you can do if you really want to pass life therapy um with the child you stay that's the younger part of the self the many 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 different parts of the self that we might visit um then we we have numerous parts of the south we only have the if we think him developmentally we you know as i say i'm 73 so if i went to therapy we could look at you know the elder parts of myself the midlife parts of myself the uh the 20s parts of myself the teenager parts of the south the we could go right down couldn't we so we yeah. and they they that they're, they're all present in some ways and they're held in our psychological sorry our physical body and we have a psychological component. So, you know, if I went to therapy now to deal with something, I was just thinking that that might be giving me problems now. It could, we could visit our, my significant other people and see, you know, well, like parents, grandparents, or wherever it is, and see whether they have, they have the same beliefs and the, did the belief systems come from there? Or we could talk to younger parts of myself and talk about how, you, how are you feeling when you're listening to this? We we could go on and on, and we could use role play to visit the different parts of ourselves. And we all know, and this is well documented, what I'm going to say now, and written about many, many times, the world of multiple personality disorder, yeah. which is often called dissociative identity disorder. I was watching a film probably about three weeks ago which I found on Netflix, it must have been made about 10, 15, 20 years, called Split. Yeah. This person had 177 parts of their selves, I think. Wow. Uh, but I can guarantee you that each self that he portrayed or got hold of would be a parent, adult, child part of that self. So times that by three immediately. So I can't give an answer to you, I'm sorry, Jackie, about how many parts of the self. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe if, so, if you'd said to me how many people are presented at any one time in the psychotherapy room, um, would I be able to answer that more accurately? Not really, because I think many different parts of the self are listening on to the other parts of the self as that part of the self talks to the therapist. That's really interesting. That's that's you, it takes a while to get your head around that what you've just said then, Bob. <laughs> yeah. I think when a person is talking to a therapist, there's many other parts of the self yeah. listening on to the dialogue between the adult and the client 
to the therapist. Yeah. And I do what? talk quite a bit with clients about that. Mm. Yeah. And quite often, if you go further with the client and say, when I'm talking to you, whatever it's about, saying, you know, you know, you're talking about how shameful X was or your anxiety or how things were difficult in your history. Is there a narrative also going on at the same time? Oh, don't talk to him about it like this. He's just trying to trick you. Or, this is just a silly question. It's all to do, or whatever narratives are going on. And usually clients will say, yes, there's another narrative going on. They might even find two, three, four, five different narratives going on all at the same time. Yeah. All from different people. See, I think that's really powerful, Bob, the fact that you point it out to them, because I think that happens with all of us, only a lot of the time we don't even <clears> notice <throat> it. Yeah, but we sort of all have, <clears throat> we all sort of are from dear, um, dissociative identity stuff to a certain degree. And maybe we all have ADHD as well to a certain degree. And maybe we're always talking to ourselves to a certain degree, but we don't actually perhaps help ourselves be aware of that. Yeah. or even to um not see it as not normal yeah 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 i often say to clients that i talk to myself do you know what i mean and i'll say things out loud or whatever it is yeah. i think it's, it's quite healthy to do that <laughs> well not only is it quite healthy it's i don't i'm uh, 73 years i don't know what's normal but i'll use the word normal in this podcast and case of what you're talking about i think it's normal in other words for us to sort of unburden ourselves and understand ourselves internally and externally we often talk to ourselves you know just to help ourselves get by in the world internally and externally and what about the concept of daydreaming jackie yeah yeah absolutely we all do that yeah. Some people would say that's disassociation or what a depersonalized. Well, mild, well, a therapist might say that's a mild form of moving moving away from the self. Most people do it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And for me, there's a lot of processing that goes on with that. Do you know what I mean? I'm processing my thoughts when I'm doing that internal dialogue stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. At the other end of the continuum, um, a friend of mine's um, has another friend who's been mentally ill for quite a long time. And they've diagnosed a hobby as schizophrenic or paranoid schizophrenic or whatever it is because of the fact of hearing voices externally rather than internally. So that's the other side of it all. Um, and people like to give some sort of diagnosis, labelling about that. In the end of the day, the problem is when those voices internally or externally or those narratives at this end of it, the more extreme end of it, inhibit our functioning or our healthy way of living. Yes. Yeah. So by definition, there has to be more than two people in the psychotherapy room. Yeah, because when we're talking about all those different people for the client, we've got all those people in us as well. We've got our I haven't even got there yet. <laughs> parents and grandparents. It's like a bloody amphitheatre. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good way to look at this, an amphitheatre. I haven't even gotten to the therapist, parent, adult, child, grandfather, and all that you're talking about. I haven't even got there yet. Yeah. I'll give you a number. But I can tell you something, it is like an amphitheatre, and there's many people watching, clapping, cheering, being sad, crying, having dramas, history, and and all sorts of other things as the script and the play um, goes on. It's the fascinating, truth. isn't it, when you think about it, Bob? Well, Eric Byrne, when he was talking about life plan that we adopt early on in our life, he called that script. Yeah. And I think... There's always many, many narratives that make up the script always going on in our head. And the therapist's reaction to all that hopefully comes from adult, but it may sometimes not. So you've got counter transfers. So we have many, many people in the room, certainly never two. Yeah. Now, payment might just pass hands for one. <laughs> 
yeah. Yeah. The yeah. rest get it for free. <laughs> but we certainly it's not just between the client and therapist and the person that believes that it's only two people in the room psychologically is pretty naive, I think. I wouldn't I don't think I'd meet a therapist or a counselor who wouldn't believe that there wasn't more psychological influences uh, or, man or manifestations in the room. I remember working with Richard Erskine, well, watching Richard Erskine work, and Richard Erskine is a mentor of mine, I mentioned probably quite a lot of times on these podcasts. And he was doing a piece of therapy. He's a therapist, well-known therapist, and somebody I learned my trade from in many ways. And he was doing what could be called in... TA parlors, a parent ego state. For people not in TA, that means talking to the part of the self, which is an internalized parental interjects or authority interjects. Yeah. And what I watched in in another language altogether could be called nexusism. Wow. In other words, you know, a nexus sort of process where Richard was talking to the, I won't say demons, but the, the, the dark forces in the person's psyche, which if you were watching it, and, and I've had conversations with somebody who was watching it from a different culture, where she said it was just like some of the exorcists I've witnessed. Uh, that's amazing. But if you talk to the dark forces, the parent parts of the self, or the grandfather parts of the self, or the parts of the self which we've internalized, which are so damaging, where they come from. Yeah. And we start to help desensitize those influences on the client's self. Is that exorcism? What, are we freeing the person up? Uh, yeah. When you say it like that, are we letting something go or freeing them up or mm. yeah, even just bringing it into clients' awareness that there are different parts to us? You know, for, for some clients, that's quite a big shift when I talk about the different ego states and the nurturing and the critical side of us and, and things like that. Yeah, I, I was just quite astonished. I did an assessment the other day and he he started immediately talking about he wanted to explore the younger part of himself and in relation to how he um, regressed in front of authority figures. Uh, but not many people, not many clients speak that way. Yeah, absolutely. Trainees, perhaps trainees do, or yeah. people who have knowledge, working knowledge of transactional analysis or developmental theory might. But you are totally correct. To help the person understand quite often their feelings or their thoughts don't originate from them, but originate from somewhere else is usually revolutionary for the, for the client. Yeah. So asking you a really important, pivotal question then, Bob, are you ready for this one? <laughs> are we ever truly our authentic selves? If, if you, and what, what does that even mean? First of all, it depends what model you're coming from. So well, I think when you're talking about TA model, um, are you talking about coming from the here and now? Uh, it depends what you mean by authentic as well. Um, but some TA therapists often believe in the moving self. In other words, the, the central self that is to be found in all ego states, all parts of self, and moves energetically throughout all of us. So when you say the authentic self, I'm assuming here you mean the real self? Yeah. Yeah. So if we're talking about the real self, which part of the self does that, that reside in? Now we're talking across therapeutic models, really. Um, a burn, that would be the adult. Yeah. Probably. Or many of the um, psychoanalysts, I'm not so sure. Certainly for young, it would be to do with archetypes and different parts of the self. So it depends who you talk to. I think, I think the real self often moves from different I parts. I quite like that, yeah. 
different parts of ourselves according to what we're talking about. Yeah. I've never heard that before, Bob. I think that I was just thinking about who started. I think Patricia Clarkson, who was a well known psychotherapist that died in 1980, I think now. I'm not quite sure when. Um, she was a well known TA therapist, talk about the construct of physis and the movement of energy across different parts of the self. And I'm not sure if she came up with the concept of the moving self. I don't know the answers to uh, what you just said, where that comes from. But I have read about the real self often being moving, or the idea that the way it real self often moves from different parts of the self. Yeah. And TA, TA theorists often think about it in terms of adult. Yeah, it, it's interesting that because we do move from one ego state to another so it would make sense that we move energetically that you know the the, the yeah. self moves yeah. energetically You're, through them right. yeah so this guy this person who came in and said oh i'd like to look at the younger part of myself which is acting out in responses to parents okay so let's go back to let's take teenage years or something yeah do you remember when you were 16 now as he starts to talk about that and starts to perhaps even do role plays or acting out from that part of himself isn't that the real self yeah 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 like, psychological time and real time is very different uh, yeah different so and can be sometimes people similar but they're basically different but it's, isn't it that the real self has just moved yeah if we're talking to the internalized parent who might be the abusive father and we talk the abusive father um uh, isn't maybe that's part of you know it depends what we're talking about what yeah. context we're talking about but we've internalized the parental interjects they're so damaging to ourselves some some people my say that's not like real self. I don't. I think that it's when we get rid of the contamination, when we get rid, well, rid of, when we've desensitized the internalized parent parental interject, that the real self often emerges. Yeah. I, I just think it's, you know, I do, people are talking a lot about being authentically them and. I'm not, I, it makes me think, I don't know who I am authentically. I think there's, there's lots of different parts to me. I'm not yeah. one person in every situation. No, I change move and adapt and move. Yeah. Yeah. Move to different parts of yourself. Someone says, oh, you, you know, you, 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 you positively, you know, you, you, you know, you're really child, you know, childlike or however they might say it at this particular time. So, you're acting out from a very real part of yourself, which at that time psychologically is younger. Yeah, yeah. That's what I mean by the moving self. Yeah. So it's an interesting question, but it, I do. It, I think as we start to move to different psychological places ourselves, I think the authentic self often moves as well. Yeah. I can remember when I was doing my transactional analysis 101 many, many moons ago at the Institute. And I think one of the questions I was asked by somebody was, how often do you think you're in your adult ego state? And me not knowing anything said, I don't know, 99% of the time because I'm an adult and that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Little did I know. <laughs> so we move. Yes context from situation to situation if we're really telling ourselves off or, or very unkind to ourselves then the younger part of ourselves often goes into hiding yeah and so then the, that the, the, yeah so it's, a, it's it's not an easy question to answer but because it's more like um i can only answer that in terms of dialogue yes yeah yeah mm. which is mm. a bit of a a insider information as to where you are yeah so but i i do think there's a whole movement called parts therapy opened up now isn't it um and people get trained in what's called parts therapy in other words talking to different developmental parts of ourself whether it's from the internalized parent to the younger self and so it, i haven't been on that training but i mean i was trained in that obviously yeah, and, yeah. And then, hey, um yeah. I'm sure if they were, if people have been training parts, they'd be listening to this podcast. 
they would have a lot to say about the different numbers of parts of ourselves which are responding all the time yeah it's interesting and then the other side which we haven't gone into so much is what you alluded to earlier on in the podcast all the different parts of the therapist that might get activated in the process of the dialogue with the client yeah yeah an interesting which is impossible for us not if we're in a relational you know session with somebody then we're we're gonna be in the room as well <laughs> all the so, parts of us yeah i want to talk about how many people are in the therapist therapy room goodness knows yeah and of course the more fragmented we are yeah the more traumatic how can I put this? The more we've defended against trauma in our lives, the more we hive off parts of ourselves and protect them. So somebody who's had a heavy lot of trauma will be protecting parts of themselves and be more fragmented. Yeah. So you've got that to think about. A client who's often seems very disturbed or has had a very traumatic history, they will have more split off parts of themselves, which they're defending against. So there's going to be even more different parts. Which you could people if you wanted to, or different parts of the self, definitely. Yeah. And it's interesting what you said earlier on about, do you know what I mean? Sometimes the child retreats and withdraws. So, you know, mm -hmm. therapy can, part of it can, being connecting with those parts of us that have mm. withdrawn, you, you know, then bringing it back into the whole person type of thing. Well, in I trained in integrative yeah. psychotherapy for a long time where integration is the curative factor Yeah. within a whole relationship. So I think in terms of fragmentation, there's big parts of the self all the time. So I, I don't think unitarily. In other words, yes. I don't think yeah. it's a whole. I think development in, I think about different parts of the self when doing therapy. Yeah. I always think about different parts of the self listening on as we talk. It's quite emotive. I, I went on a, a retreat in March. And while we were there, we had to write a letter to our future self. There we are. And she posted it back to me a week ago. Oh, wow. And it was really, it really impacted me reading this letter that I wrote back in March to the me who opened the letter and received it a week ago. It was very powerful. Yeah. So there we are talking about different, talking to our, or having a dialogue with the different cells, senses of the self. Yeah. It, it's very, um, often very complex therapy, but I would always encourage people to think developmentally, to, to think about split off parts of the self yeah. when we're talking about, you know, how many people, parts of the self are present in therapy. Another really interesting topic, Bob. Yeah, I, I like that. And of course, it's what I was trained in. Yeah. So I always think that way. Yeah, I do like the script analysis. I do use that quite a lot. Yeah. yeah. So well, what we allow me to talk about this because it's very stimulating to me. Yeah, it is for me too. All our conversations are stimulating, Bob. So what yeah. we're going to look at next time, which I'm not sure whether we've discussed this in other podcasts, is contracts a prerequisite for effective therapy. Oh well, could I ask you to look do something? To, well, we've got two options, and let me pass them by. You probably got many more options. Actually. We have one of them. You could look at if we talk. So here's three off the top of it. You could look at, have we talked about effective contracts before? And then we have a decision. Do we do can we do another podcast on that? So it's like uh, we're now 167 in or whatever it is. So yeah, we're revisiting yeah. contracts. We could do a podcast about uh, something like uh, uh, something like the idea of contracts versus the idea of the therapist allowing the content to just emerge so in other words 
we could talk about advantages and disadvantages of contracts. That sounds like a good topic. I've written down contracts versus content. How about the advantages and disadvantages of contracts in the therapy process? Right. Because I know we haven't done that. We've done, we've talked about contracts. We talked, I think, about other things, but not specifically disadvantages and advantages of contracts. That's a good way of looking at it. Right, we'll do that one. And then the one after that, which I'm really looking forward to, is shadow and light within the therapy process. Which we've job, kind of touched on a little bit, yeah. Uh, and Young, of course, talked a lot about that. But yes, that'll be an interesting one as well. Okay, Bob, until next time. Have a good week. Thank you very much, and you. Bye. 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 You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.